You see the same, same thing in criminal behavior. Hardly anyone is a criminal. Yeah. Then if you take the fraction of people who are criminals, most of them are like one, two time criminals, right? Yep. But there's a, there's a hardcore. professional hardcore group that commit all the crimes. Yep. Well, it's the same thing with sexual assault and sexual harassment. Well, you don't want to confuse the action of some of the men with all of the men. Like, it's really important to get that distinction right, and we're not getting that distinction right well, at all. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, is that, it, you know, we, it, it's critical to differentiate among, first of all, among the offenses, surely. Well, right? you'd hope so. Uh, and among the uh, perpetrators or alleged perpetrators, and yet now there, the discussion seems to be turning to, um, you know, to almost an attack on the masculinity of uh, yeah, corporations, well, well, you know, yeah. hierarchies and, yeah. and companies <clears throat> and how is it possible that we don't recognize, well we do, most of us, but there's that minimum at one end and then there's somebody who's sexually assaulting women, physically raping well, women. Well, some of it is that there's a concerted effort on the part of the radical postmodern left to erase the distinction between categories of criminal behavior. Categories is all we got. Yeah, but the postmodernists don't like categories. You see, that's that's if you go way down in into the into the structure of the current culture wars, yeah. what you see is that at the very base of it, there's two things that the postmodern neo Marxists are they're they're full scale assaulting. One is categorization because they believe that the only function of categorization is power. The other one is that um, there's a war on competence. Because if you admit that there are hierarchical structures that are predicated on competence, then, it, then you have to grapple with the issue of competence and you have to grapple with the issue of valid hierarchy. If all hierarchy is power and all power is corrupt and all corrupt power is tyranny, then you can't admit to competence. But the downside, there's a, there's a terrible price to be paid for that because every value system produces a hierarchy. So if you dispense with the hierarchy, you dispense with the value systems. Recently, uh, you know, uh, the, the founding director and creative director, I think he was, Albert Schultz from the Soul Pepper Theatre Company, was the latest in Canada to be accused of what sounds like a pretty wide range of offenses. Why are women coming forward now about events that happened 15 or 20 years ago? Okay, well let's let's address that two ways. I mean, the first, there's been an adolescent insistence since the early 60s that sexual behavior can be rule-free. Now a lot of that was generated as a consequence of the birth control sure. pill, right? Because it yeah. was like, that's a biological revolution. All right, all of a sudden women can control their reproductive function in principle. Question one, what does that make women? Because now they're a new biological entity, right? Yeah. And so it's wide open. What are women now? We don't know. The next thing that's wide open is, well, maybe there are no rules for sex then. There's an impulsive part of huma human beings, it's associated with the sexual drive, obviously, that would love it if there were no rules governing sexual behavior, sure. because then it would be all orgies all the time with no consequences, right? And so, but the problem is, is that all of that's untrue because you can't divorce sexuality from emotion you also can't divorce it from responsibility you can't divorce it from family you can't divorce it from respect you can't divorce it from children like it, it's so central you can't divorce it from power you can't divorce it from tyranny or love like it's it's central and it and it involves all those other things and so there are rules the question is what are the rules and the answer is no one knows. So there's going to be mistakes everywhere, all the time. Where do you draw the line between a, a sexual invitation and harassment? Well, like a cynic would say, anything unwanted is harassment. Well, how the hell is the person who's making the offer supposed to distinguish, determine that beforehand? Yeah, you, you make the offer or the invitation in part to find out whether it's, it's welcome. Wanted. Yes, and the, the, the terrible thing about that in part is that it's almost always men who do that. Right, men make the offer. And almost always it's rejected. And it's almost always rejected even by women who might be interested under some circumstances. Yep. Now, the reason for that, as far as I can tell, is that women bear a much heavier price for sexual activity than men do. So they're the ones that are going to say no. The problem is, is that we need to know exactly where the rules are, and we don't.
In this climate, though, where we're not sure of the rules, we're not sure where the lines are, when does a glance become a sexual offense? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a sexual offense right away if it's a microaggression. Tell, tell people what a microaggression is. I think we all hear that now, and we're not really sure what it means. I'm not, anyway. A microaggression is any act, no matter how subtle, that makes the recipient uncomfortable, regardless of the intent of oh, the perpetrator. Good grief. Right. Good grief. Yeah, because we're getting away from intent, eh? Hey? Yep. It's all consequence. It's all yeah. how it's received. Yes, yes, yes. And so, so, and that's being written into the law very rapidly, by the way. So we're moving from a legal system where intent matters to a legal system where consequences matter, which is really the eradication of the legal system. But it doesn't matter because the the postmodern radicals who increasingly occupy the law schools believe that Western law is a patriarchal and oppressive tradition and that undermining it and destroying it by doing things like removing due process and insisting on preponderance of evidence and going for consequence rather than intent, that's fine because all they're doing is tearing down a, a, a terrible Patriot. tyrannical par patriarchal structure. Having never had the fortune to spend any time in an Iranian prison, for example, they're not very good at distinguishing between what constitutes a tyranny and what constitutes a free society. Until we figure all this stuff out, assuming we will at some point, the sexual stuff I'm talking about, can ordinary men and ordinary women continue to work together? A lot of it's emergent self-protection. You yeah. know, men say, don't ever have a meeting with a woman when the door's closed. Yeah. In fact, I've been told that at the university. Yeah. Never have a meeting with a student with the door closed. It's like I ignore that because there's no damn way I'm doing that. But that's, that's common practice. I don't know the answer to whether or not men and women can work together en masse because it's not, not under the current conditions. We don't have the rules right. My pleasure. Now, an amazing response already to you here in Australia, and I think that shows that there's the same hunger for your wisdom, your homespun wisdom here as there is elsewhere in the world. Can I ask you if you have any insights, I know you've only been here a few days, but into Australian culture, if you were to psychoanalyse the country, is it there anything different here from Canada or Australia in terms of being more or less vulnerable to the sort of ailments you talk about? I don't know if there's anything that, that makes Australia specifically, say, more vulnerable than Canada. I mean, there there is the issue of wrestling with a colonial past and exactly what needs to be done to mitigate the negative consequences of that in the present, as well as simultaneously attempting to maintain and promote what's good about Australian, say, Canadian, Western culture in general. Um, I don't see that, that there's anything outstandingly peculiar about the Australian situation that, that isn't being experienced pretty much everywhere else in the West. Now... Is it true that you had six young people approach you in Melbourne after your speech there and say that you saved their life? Yes, that, yeah, that, it, it, that was, yes, definitely. That happens all the time. So how does that make you feel when people say that? Well, it's overwhelming, really. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's against a, a background that's the same except in a lesser manner. I mean... I would say there was probably 500 people who lined up after the talk in Melbourne to have a book signed and, and uh, to say a few words. And certainly, I would think that was 300 of them said something that was a variant of that. It wasn't as intense. You know, they didn't say, well, I was suicidal and your lectures helped me rise out of that. But they did say my life, you know, I, I was afflicted by addiction or alcoholism or an unhappy relationship or pointlessness in my life or nihilism or, or anger, all, all sorts of things. And that listening to the lectures, my lectures on YouTube and, and have, have helped that a lot. And, you know, those were sometimes single people, but often couples who said the same thing or sometimes parents with their kids. And so, and that's very, that's very standard. That's what happens every time I do a public talk. It's the same thing. And, I've received probably 30,000 email messages with the same content in the last six months. So what is it that you're saying that is striking such a chord? That's a good question. I mean, you know, I would say to some degree it's not surprising in that I'm a clinical psychologist and 
the lectures that I've put online have been, the content has been drawn in large part from the great psychologists of the 20th century. You know, it's, it's, it's by no means perfectly original content, perfectly original. The, the ideas aren't perfectly original formulations of my own, right? I mean, I've been influenced by many, many people. And, of course, clinical psychologists and psychiatrists are concerned with the promotion of mental health and the idea that making that sort of knowledge widespread would have a salutary effect on people stands to reason, assuming that the profession has some, uh, some genuine quality and, and, uh, and value. I think there's more to it than that. I, I think I'm able to bridge the gap between very high levels of abstraction, the sorts of abstractions, say, that might characterize work by people like Carl Jung, who's a very, very difficult thinker. I'm able to bridge the gap between that abstract reality and, and concrete day-to-day -day life. And that's partly because I was trained both as a psycho psychoanalytic thinker and as a behavioral thinker. And behaviorists, behavioral psychologists are very, very, very practical people. You know, the, the, the idea, if you're a behavioral psychologist, is always how to break tasks down into um, into manageable units that will be implemented successfully. So there's this mixture of abstraction, philosophical abstraction, say, and practicality that I think people find very useful. And I think the other issue is, is that it actually matters to me whether the people that I'm lecturing to do better. That's why I'm doing this. I really hope that they do better. You know, I, I've been working with my colleagues as well with the programs we've designed. We've designed these self-authoring programs online that thousands of people have done now. And we set out 20 years ago to bring low-cost, large-scale, practical mental health interventions to thousands of people. That was the goal of our enterprise. And my business partner, Daniel Higgins, worked on that project for 15 years before it really bore any fruit, I would say. So, so are people having more mental health issues now than in previous eras? Well, I don't know uh, if they have more. I think they're, it's hard to say. It's, it's a very difficult thing to measure, you know, because the, because measuring mental health is a very tricky issue. But I would say that there is something of a, an ongoing crisis of meaning that, characterize, that characterizes people's lives, especially as they try to make the transition between adolescence and adulthood. And the intense self-criticism that we've subjected ourselves to in the West isn't, it has its utility, obviously, but it isn't helping. I mean, one of the things that's really striking to me is, it's sad, actually, and, and overwhelming at the same time, is that the people who come up to me and write me and, and talk about how their lives have been improved, you know, they haven't had any encouragement. And they're particularly so, young and, men, aren't they? Well, they, yes and no. I mean, it, that's a tricky issue because most of the people who watch YouTube are young men, you know, men under 40, let's say. And so whether – so I don't know if the fact that so many of the people who are listening to me are young men is merely a secondary consequence of the base rate of YouTube use, but – it's certainly the case that at the public lectures, a higher and higher proportion of the audience has, is, is female as, as the lectures progress. And the audience is skewing older, too. So I think maybe the young men, younger men picked it up first because it was on YouTube. But it isn't clear to me that, that that's, um, that's diagnostic. H having said that, I do think that there is a crisis of encouragement in relationship to young men, because mm -hmm. most of the discussion of masculinity in our current culture is discussion of its toxicity, and and why is uh, that? Uh, well, I think it's partly because we are in a general, we're in a genuine cultural war, a very deep one, a war of ideas, and the the, the people who are driving the critique, and so those would be the postmodern. Those would be postmodern neo-Marxists, essentially, 
regard Western culture as a corrupt patriarchy, a corrupt radical patriarchy uh, whose wealth is entirely generated by exploitation and derive from that the secondary conclusion that anybody engaged in activity that's associated with that structure is doing something reprehensible and 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 cruel and that's simply that's I think every culture has a tyrannical aspect you have to be naive not to see that mm. but to make the case that there's something particularly tyrannical about western culture and that active engagement in promoting and maintaining that culture is somehow pathological is I think it's reprehensible and I think the universities are in large part to blame for that, much to my chagrin. And so, you know, if, if the patriarchy is a corrupt tyranny and it's, it's masculine-centered, then men who act in the world are to blame. And so what that means is the whole idea of acting in the world becomes criticized. And, you know, it's not that easy to act in a courageous and productive manner in the world, you need to be, you need to have a reason for it. There needs to be a motivation for it. it. It needs to be welcomed with open arms, certainly not criticized to death. And one of the things that's really striking about what I see, and that's a constant source of sadness to me, is just how little encouragement so many thousands of people need. Mm. You know, and my message isn't, it's not like it's still a good message, you know. I had a journalist the other day ask me if he said he couldn't figure out if I was the world's biggest pessimist or the world's biggest optimist. <laughs> and the pessimistic element is, you know, but basically what I'm, what I'm part of what I've been communicating is the idea that life is genuinely tragic and people are subject to malevolence and betrayal from themselves and other people. And that's if, if you look into that, it's the more you look into that, the darker it gets. It's terrible but that people have the capacity to transcend that. And that's, and that's the optimistic part of it. And, but that means, generally speaking, that you have to be more than you are. You know? and, and what we've been feeding young people, we've been feeding this idiot idea for five decades that they're okay the way they are. It's like no young person wants to hear that, especially not if they're not feeling like their life is worth living. Someone pats them on the back mm -hmm. and says, oh, you're okay just the way you are. It's like they think, well, no, I'm... I'm I'm aimless, I'm depressed, I'm, I'm, uh, a, I have a plethora of bad habits. I don't know where I'm going in my life or why, and I know I'm not everything I should be, and yet, you know, I'm patted on the back, and people say, well, it's going to be all right. It's like, well, no one believes that. And so partly what I've been insisting upon is that you're not okay the way you are. Get the hell going. Well, Grow up. Wake up. And that's your new book, which is number one on Amazon, of course, 12 Rules for Life. And you yeah. say that people should stand up straight and clean up their room, but also that we should tell the truth and be orderly and have a routine and eat well and go to bed early. And these are sort of age-old wisdom that used to be taught by parents to small children. Why, why is it not... You know, why are you pretty much the only person saying that now? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Well, you know, it's funny because I, I picked the rules. The rules are obviously in some ways, you could call them somewhat self-evident, you know. I mean, there's an ironic tone to them even because of their self-evidence. But I think the reason that they strike a chord is, well, number one is they're not promoted because no real active ethic is promoted except harmlessness mm. and harmlessness is not an ethic and harmless people are not virtuous so that's a big mistake but what I did in 12 rules for life is take these let's say commonplaces and explain why they're commonplace and that's not so easy because when so, when some when people take something for granted they don't need to understand it. Everyone just takes it for granted. But when you stop taking it for granted, then you have to dig down and find out why it was self-evident to begin with. And self-evident things are profound. 
know, otherwise they wouldn't be important enough to be self-evident. Yeah. And so when I say, like, in, I think it's rule seven, I think it's rule seven, uh, tell the truth or at least don't lie. I think that's rule eight. Rule eight. Yeah. 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 It, it's like, well, yeah, everyone knows that. Well, sure, but people don't know why. And there's actually a real reason. The reason is, is if you lie, you will ruin your life, and you'll ruin the lives of other people around you. And there's very specific reasons why. And so I don't just say, tell the truth or at least don't lie. I say, look, here's why this is important, and I actually know why. And, and when I lay it out, people find it compelling because I'm not pulling any punches. You know, and I have enough experience to have seen these things. I have thousands of hours of clinical experience, and I've seen what deceit does to people's lives. It's absolutely devastating. And it isn't just in their own private lives that it's devastating. When, when a culture becomes rife with deceit, mm. then it turns into a barbaric tyranny and everyone dies. So why? these things are why is, unbelievably important. Why is telling the truth so important? Well... You, because something truthful, it, it goes along with the idea of standing up straight, I would say, which is a metaphorical idea as well as a physical idea. To st stand up straight with your shoulders back is to expose yourself voluntarily to the catastrophe of the world, right? To take it on forthrightly, despite the fact that, despite the fact of its tragic and often malevolent nature. So it's an act of courage, and to to not lie, because who knows the truth, right? But to not lie is to admit to what's in front of your eyes and to try to adapt to it. You know, what's the old saying? If the blind leads the blind, then they, if a blind man leads a blind man, they both fall into a pit. Hmm. And, and that's, that's a meditation on the, la on the, on the, the danger of, of failing to, to open your eyes to what's in front of you. You fall into a pit. The, the thing about life is that the punishment for transgression is unbelievably harsh. And so if you falsify this, if you attempt to falsify the reality that you inhabit, how can anything good come of that? I mean, maybe you can extract out some short-term gain, you know, and people can fool themselves into thinking that that's maintainable, but it's not. You, you can't twist the fabric of reality without expecting it to snap back and take you out. And it's self-evident in some sense. It's like if you, if you tell yourself that there's no wall in front of you and you walk forward, you'll bump your nose if there's a wall. And your, your hand-waving, your theoretical hand-waving and failure to admit to what's right in front of your eyes isn't going to help you in the least. And there's other reasons, too, is without truth, there's no contractual relationship between people. It's just distrust and hostility and, and force. And if, if you establish trust between people, which you can do if everyone, if people do their best not to lie, then people can cooperate and compete peacefully and productively. And everyone, we can all, what, we can all raise the water that raises all the boats. Mm. And that's well documented. We know perfectly well that in, in functional societies, and those are mostly Western societies, the default transaction between strangers is honest. eBay is a good example of that. And that makes everyone rich. The truth makes everyone rich, <laughs> even though it's very difficult to tolerate. Well, I mean, you told the truth. Uh, it's what brought you to prominence, really, in Canada when you made a stand against being forced to use genderless pronouns. Uh, you know, since then, you've had 50 million people watch you on your YouTube videos and you've become a household name around the world. How, have, I mean, have you had time to process that change, how your life has changed in 18 months and why? No, I wouldn't say so. It's, it, it requires constant adaptation. Um, the thing is, is that, you know, I kind of, I could perhaps get accustomed to, or a person, let's say, might get accustomed to that transformation at one level, but it's kept expanding continually for 18 months. And so just as I get used to one level, let's say, or, or rather used to it, 
then something else happens that that makes everything surreal again. And that's been happening constantly since September of 2016. I've been in one major scandal after another for 18 months on about a two-week basis. <laughs> and so, and, and I mean really major scandals, you know. I mean, uh, there was the James DeMore scandal at Google, and there was a scandal at Wilfrid Laurier University, which in Canada, which is the biggest scandal that ever hit the Canadian that, University. And, unbelievable. Uh, you were likened to Hitler by an academic at that university. Well, Hitler, Hitler or Milo Yiannopoulos, you know, you <laughs> can take your choice. Yeah. Those idiot that radical leftists can't even get their insults straight. But that, but that, that interview of that teaching assistant who'd used a short video clip of yours to show to her yeah. class as a, not to propagandise them, but just to open up debate... And then she was put through that really terrifying cross-examination by her superiors. Yeah, well, there was only three of them and, and one whole student. She was 22, you know, mm. two professors and an administrator who was hired for that purpose and who basically got off scot-free. A diversity uh, in, person, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, wonderful, yes. And, and perfectly indicative of exactly the sort of person who holds those kinds of positions. Yeah, and it was like... You know, when, when I stood up against Bill C-16 or, or, or stated, wouldn't say stood up against it, but stated that there was no bloody way I was going to follow its dictates come hell or high water. You now, I was accused by many people of scaremongering. And, and what, were, what was, the, to just explain what that was yeah. about, that was the genderless Well, that's pronoun. the compelled speech, that's yeah. the compelled speech legislation. You know, and it, it also turned into a debate about my attitude towards, you know, homosexual people and trans people and, you know, minority people and Jews even and, and, and people who were Muslim and all of that. It was completely beside the point. It had nothing to do with any of that. It had to do with our idiot government's decision that it was okay to use compelled speech, to force compelled speech, and it's not okay. It's not even a little bit okay. And the, that Lindsay Shepard event was a perfect example. Well, first, the first thing, of course, was that the university tried to shut me down because they thought that what I was doing might be illegal, which is exactly what I was warning about. Hmm. So that was the first bit of proof that what I was saying wasn't merely the paranoid suppositions of an eccentric professor. <laughs> and I actually am not an eccentric professor, and I read the damn policies and I understood them. So and that's why the legal people in, in Canada wouldn't debate me and still won't. So, but, you know, so the university wrote me these letters telling me to shut down because they were afraid that what I was doing was illegal and that they'd be held responsible for it, which is exactly what the legislation indicates. And then, of course, this event broke out at, at Wilfrid Laurier, which was far worse than anything that I had imagined. I didn't imagine it would go to the point where a teaching assistant would be accused of breaking federal and provincial law and and subject to an inquisition merely because she showed a piece of a video from Canadian public television discussing the issue. But I thought that's exactly right. That's exactly, it was a perfect illustration of the dangers that I was not pointing out, you know, not, but seeing. And everyone knew it, and that's why it became, well, it, it, it's a scandal that became known across the Western world. So you know, how do you been like one of a dozen scandals? I can't even keep track of them. So <laughs> it's so, so funny. I'll tell you what my life's been like. This <laughs> is so funny. So one day, it was about four months ago. It was right in the middle of that Lindsay Shepherd affair. The the radical leftists were all up in arms because they got such bad press because of what had happened. And so a bunch of them signed a petition at the University of Toronto trying to get me fired again for some statement I made that they blew out of proportion. So they sent a petition. This was the University of Toronto Faculty Association, which is my union that represents me, hypothetically. Huh. They sent a, a petition to the administrators at the university calling for my head. And about 200 of them signed it. And my son came over and, and I said, gee, Julian, you know, my the union at the university has just sent a petition signed by 200 of my so-called colleagues asking for me to be removed from my position. And she said, oh, Dad, don't worry about it. It was only 200 people. And I thought, it just made me laugh because I thought, yeah, well, this is, this is what life is, is like at the moment. It's just like when, when, when all that's happening that day is that 200 of my colleagues are calling me to be fired, that's, 
that's something to just laugh off because it's not very serious. It must be hard, though. I, I know that you've said in your personality test that you give to people that you've come up as having an agreeable personality. So you're telling the truth um, brings you into conflict with a lot of people. That must be difficult. Yeah, well, it's not... I, I wouldn't say I revel in it by any stretch of the imagination. Like these... I find it... Yeah, I find it... Well, I take the criticism to heart. There's no doubt about that. And, you know, when I was, I was just at Queen's University a few days before I came to Australia, and that was just a surreal nightmare. I, I don't know if you've seen any of the footage of mm. that. That caused a huge scandal in Canada again. Um, I mean, it was terrible. We were in this building that was like a church. You know, it was part of the old campus at Queen's University. And uh, there was a line of stained glass windows down one side of the building, and here about 10 feet high, I guess, probably about five feet off the ground, maybe seven feet. And the protesters climbed up into the window wells and beat on the windows. There's about 900 of us inside the hall, very well-behaved students, by the way, inside the hall and, mm. and capable of formulating very intelligent questions. And they beat on the windows for an hour and a half. And one of them was broken by one of the more, uh, what would we call it, active protesters. And she was later arrested she bit a policeman and kicked the window in the in the car, and then they found a bloody garage in her mm. knapsack. You know, it was like when well, people have commented on this online. It was like being in the in the movie The Night of the Living Dead. You know, <laughs> we're inside there, and there were shadowy figures at the window pounding. But what's you wrong know, with the, that? That's that's not normal behaviour. I mean, it's not that anything you're saying is so repellent. Why wow. is it affecting these people? Like that. Because I'm after the radical leftists, and they know it, mm. Mm. and I'm really after them. I, I I have the same contempt for radical leftists that I have for Nazis. There's no excuse for it, and I think that they've corrupted the university probably beyond repair, and well, that mostly what they do is indoctrinate students, and, and I've made my point very vociferously, so they're out after me at every point 